Welcome to the Come to Your Senses podcast. I'm your host, Mary Lofgren. Here we explore how to live bravely and beautifully through pleasure, mindfulness, embodiment, femininity, beauty, art, and of course, everyday sensuality. Hello, beautiful, and welcome to Come to Your Senses, the School of Sensual Living podcast. This is Mary Lofgren, and I'm so excited to share with you this inaugural episode, which is really starting at the beginning with redefining your relationship to your sensuality. So that word, sensuality, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For some people, simply saying the word sensuality is uncomfortable because of its eroticism. For some people, sensuality feels unattainable because they equate it with a life of endless comfort, such as, you know, never having to work again and going on endless vacations and eating chocolate all the time. For some people, sensuality feels like a ship that sailed 10 or 20 years ago that's no longer available to them because it's only available to the young and thin and spry. For some people, sensuality feels so inaccessible because who has the time when you're running a family and working and maybe running a business or just even doing one of those things? And for some, for many, it brings up such extreme vulnerability that it is just so much easier to leave that door closed and to go through life numb, but invulnerable. And no matter where you find yourself on that spectrum, what we're going to talk about today is a redefinition of sensuality that is available and accessible and beneficial to everyone. And where I'd like to begin is by sharing a story with you of being seven years old and making my sacrament of penance. And the context of this story is, it's a story that I think we can all relate to as a formative story of the decisions that we make about feeling good in our body and what that means. So when I was a child, I was very, very Catholic. I loved religion. I loved Really, the essence was that I loved God and I loved love and I loved Jesus and the unconditional love that that represented. And the only way that I had to express that love was within the very limited confining structure of the Catholic Church. But at seven years old, I didn't know any better, so I just felt like church was Disneyland. So your penance is when you first confess your sins to a priest in order to receive forgiveness. And I'm wearing the white first penance dress and the white Mary Jane's patent leather. And I'm walking up onto the marble altar and my heels are click clacking and I feel like such a grown up. And I go in and I feel extremely proud of myself that I choose to visit the priest face to face instead of going behind the screen, cowering in shame. (laughs) And I kneel down and I say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Old priest, white hair, bad breath, the whole deal. And I say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And now comes the moment when I am to tell him my sins. And I realize that I'm seven years old and I don't really have many sins. You know, I haven't killed anybody. At that point, I wasn't really having lustful thoughts. I was having crushes, which I had mixed feelings about, but... You know, I I really kind of searched myself, and when I couldn't come up with anything, I just made a couple of things up. So I remember telling him, this was true, that I had done a cartwheel that morning in my kitchen, which my grandmother had forbade me to do, and she wasn't looking, but felt sinful anyway. We had a cookie jar that was shaped like a Franciscan friar, and it said on the outside, thou shalt not steal. And I would steal cookies from that jar and sweets from that jar when no one was looking. And then I just randomly blurted out, I burnt the toast this morning (laughs) and hoped that that would somehow count. 
And so the priest gives me my penance. And penance, as, as it's defined by the dictionary, is voluntary self-punishment inflicted as an outward expression of having done wrong. Ouch. So the priest gives me a couple of prayers, and one of them is the act of contrition. And then so I walk out, and I kneel down in the church, and I've got my hands perfectly poised in prayer under my chin, and my spine is straight. And I say my act of contrition, and my lips are whispering these words. I firmly intend, God, with your help to do penance, to sin no more, and to avoid whatever leads me to sin. And while my little lips are uttering these words, my mind comes in like a charging bull and says, but Mary, you like sinning. <laughs> I remember it so clearly. I remember hearing those words in my mind and being so horrified that I shoved them out of the way and covered them up like a dog kicking dirt over its poop. And I just remember in that moment, that neural pathway being formed, like a significant, if I think about neural pathways as like railroad tracks, a significant chunk of the railroad track being laid down that formed the belief that if I'm feeling good in my body, doing cartwheels or eating sweets, it must mean I am doing something very, very wrong. And that if I am suffering, it must mean I am in God's pocket. And so this particular railroad track led to a number of different stops on my life journey that I'm going to share with you throughout this podcast that I won't be sharing with you today. But some of the brief overview is falling very deep into rigidity around my faith and wanting to be a nun until I was a teenager, then falling into an eating disorder that almost took my life because I felt so much revulsion towards my own body and its sinfulness, to having a massive transformation around my sensuality and becoming a burlesque performer in New York City. For years, I went by the persona Kitty Cavalier, which is how you may know me from my previous work, and finding the deepest healing of my life in slapping glitter on my thighs and twirling tassels in front of an audience of 200 people. But where we find ourselves today is if I could take that whole journey and imagine that journey was like a bucket of sand that I then sifted and sifted and sifted for the most precious jewels. That's what I have to share with you today about redefining your relationship to sensuality, to one of redemption, communion, and imprinting the sacredness of life into your cells through your senses. And so as I shared at the start, it's a lot less vulnerable to go through life numbing ourselves to sensuality than it is to open ourselves to it. To illustrate that, I want to share with you a quote from one of my favorite mindfulness teachers, Susan Piver. So Susan says, when you open your heart, you don't know what's going to come in. You don't get to choose in advance. If you've already chosen, your heart is not open. The open heart can't be controlled. You can't predict it. It actually predicts you. And for me and the thousands of women that I've worked with in my community, which has evolved over time but is currently called the School of Sensual Living, this is really the essence of what sensual living and sensuality is. A way of living with an open heart through the tenderness and the beauty and the wonder and the humanity of your body. Sensuality is also a profound way to heal and recover from trauma. When you are in trauma, whether that's big T trauma or what we call little T trauma, big T trauma might be being attacked or being in war, 
kind of traditionally what we associate with traumatic experiences. And then there's little t trauma, which are things like what happened as a child that may not seem super traumatic to the outsider's gaze, but like me kneeling, saying the act of contrition for burning the toast, created belief systems that keep you in a state of fight, flight, freeze today. And when we are in fight, flight, freeze, or some of the more advanced phases of a trauma response, which again, we'll talk about in future episodes of this podcast, because it's really important to understanding your sensuality. Being in your body can be unbearable. And yet the practices that we use to help recover from trauma, such as orienting, noticing what you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you feel, taking deep breaths, all of these are simple practices to use your senses to help your mind tell the difference between reality and what is happening right now and what has happened in the past. So when it comes to this different expression of sensuality that is not about a sexualized experience of sensuality, but it is more the everyday experience of being in your body, the most common question that I get from students, from clients, and from just people I meet at cocktail parties is, how do I stay sensual when life is so busy? It's easy to have a sensual experience if you're on vacation on the beach or if it's a Sunday afternoon and you have no plans and you're curled up with a book. But how do you say sensual when you've been working for 10 hours and you have to come home and make dinner and deal with your screaming children? How do you stay sensual when you've been at the office under fluorescent lights all day? So there's two ways to answer this question. There's the traditional way, which is the work harder method. Well, you could buy yourself flowers to put on your desk every week and you could go home and you could make dinner and you could eat it on your good china and you could put lavender in your kid's bath. And do you hear in my voice how my tone and my pitch and my speed has picked way up? And all of these are great ideas. And it's not that those things won't impart more sensuality in your life. But I'm less and less interested in the work harder method when it comes to having an experience of this energy that we sometimes call the feminine, which is this more receptive, more slow, more in the moment, more sensual energy. And an experience of sensuality that is not about making you work harder or do more, where it is a shift in mindset, not an increase in consumption. I'm going to say that again, where your orientation to sensuality is about a shift in mindset, not an increase in your consumption, intrinsic instead of extrinsic. It doesn't require you to change anything except where and how you put your attention. And what I want to share with you now are ways that you can put this shift in mindset into practice. And if you're like me, if you hear five ways to do anything, you just want to run. <laughs> you know, I, I, I saw on um, the internet recently, like five simple ways to heal your mother wound. And, uh, you know, it's just, I mean, it's just crazy to me. And, and yet it's not crazy. We want things to be figure outable, right? We want things to be simplified and distilled down to five steps so that we can conquer them. And I want to just qualify and say that this is not five steps to transform your relationship to sensuality and then you're done. And so these are five, if you think about a, a bag full of jewels, these are five jewels that I've plucked to embodying this shift in mindset around sensuality. So the first has to do with slowing down. And slowing down is something you hear about a lot these days. You know, oh, I, I need to slow life down. I, I, everything's going so fast. I need to, I, I just, I got to slow down. I just can't seem to slow down. You, it seems like you hear that from everybody. And it's almost like slowing down becomes this other thing that we now have to add to our list. You know, it's not 
it's not enough that we have a million things. Now we have to add doing them slowly in order to do them right. And what I would like to offer you is a really simple tool that you can use to bring that slowness in, independent of what's happening in your life. And that is to physically slow down your gesture, your walk, and your speech. I heard this radio commercial recently for a detergent and there was the talking of the detergent and the features and the benefits and the brand name. And then right after saying the brand name at the end, they allowed for just the sound of a washing machine like sloshing. And I just thought, God, that is so genius to make people pay attention because there's so much noise in this world and we don't pay attention to the noise. We pay attention to the quiet. And the same goes for when you are in conversation. So the next time you're in a conversation, and you can even try it with me now, you'll notice that on this podcast, I try to speak slowly and deliberately. And I offer deliberate pauses between the words to give your mind a chance to chew before it swallows. And so the next time you find yourself in a conversation, physically slowing down the gestures of your hands, physically slowing down the speed and the pace of your words, and you will automatically notice that life and time begins to slow and you didn't even have to finish the laundry. The second way to embody this new mindset around sensuality is to change your thought and allow that to change your sensory experience. So I'll invite you to do this with me now, whether you're sitting, you can even do this if you're driving a car, you can do this if you're walking. I want you to just notice your body language as it is now. And just notice what's going on with your spine, your shoulders, if you're walking, your pace, your attention. And now I want you to just repeat with me like a mantra. I am a mesmerizing sensual creature. I am a mesmerizing sensual creature. And as you begin to repeat that mantra, allowing your body to respond. So if you are a mesmerizing sensual creature, how do you sit? How do you stand? How do you walk? And so noticing how being a mesmerizing sensual creature is really just one thought away. That it's not something that you have to learn, but rather something to remember simply by changing and adopting your belief and allowing your body to respond to that inner knowing. And if you found that exercise kind of awkward and like you didn't really know what to do with your body, this next exercise may help you go deeper into the experience. And so I want you to just take your wrist, your inner arm, and expose it. And with the other hand, begin to stroke from wrist to elbow, just touching your skin. And what I want you to do right now is I want you to make it look really sensual, look really sexy, Focus all your intention on how it might look to an admirer who you're trying to appear sensual to. And then when you're complete, if you're in a place where you can close your eyes and it's safe and comfortable to do so, closing your eyes, focusing entirely on what it feels like to let your senses take the lead. When you focus your attention on allowing this experience to feel sensual and let go of how it looks, how does that change your experience? And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And if we were in class together, I would ask you, how did that feel? What did you notice? And I'm always curious about that. So please feel free to connect with me on Instagram. Hello, Mary Lofgren to share with me 
uh, what you noticed from that exercise. But, you know, often when it comes to adopting these new beliefs, it can feel like such a head game. And sometimes a mantra can feel like a thought on lease or a thought on rent that you're borrowing. And that's fine. Borrowing beliefs is just fine. But in this conversation around embodiment, as my friend Rochelle Sheik would say, focusing less on what it looks like, more on how it feels to be in your senses and to be that mesmerizing sensual creature. The fourth way to have a sensual experience, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, is to shift the way that you listen. So I've taken tons of courses on communication and assertiveness and listening skills and coaching and feeding back to people what you hear and focused attention and all of these things. But the most effective listening skill I've ever heard and the most sensory is from a meditation teacher named Deborah Eden Tull. And I was in a workshop with her and she said, really great listening is just a practice of relaxation. And that technique alone, as someone who has a ton of dissociation pattern in my system, that's really kind of at the locus of why I do this work and why it's so powerful for me is it's really easy for me to vaporize, especially in a socially tense or anxious situation. And when I vaporize, it's like my body is there, but my mind is in a completely different place entirely and I'm kind of floating above. And this technique alone has completely revolutionized my communications and my ability to feel safe and secure in new social environments. So I highly recommend next time you find yourself in a conversation and you notice yourself flying away or your attention is departing, trying out this practice of having your listening skills be directly proportionate to your willingness and openness to relaxation in the moment. And then the fifth tool of how to embody sensuality from the inside out is to perform a deliberate act of beauty. So we spoke earlier about how there's the hard work approach and the more intrinsic approach of sensuality. And the truth is about 80% of sensuality is intrinsic. And then there's that 20%, maybe it's more, maybe it's less. I think it really depends on the person that is very much environmental. So to give you an example of that, I grew up in a home where there was a lot of mess and a lot of just, you know, like in order to survive in my home, I had to really shut down my senses. Environmentally, it was not safe for me to have a sensual experience because of smell and because of sight and because of touch, because there was this abundance of mess. And so... It didn't matter how willing I was to open my senses. My nervous system was like, no go, doors closed, Uh uh-uh. And one of the most lubricated, for lack of a better word, ways that we can help to open our senses and create a sense of safety within is through the deliberate addition of more beauty into our lives. And so you hear tools and tips like having flowers on your kitchen table or putting on lipstick, even if you don't feel like it, even if you feel like nobody's going to see you, lipstick is an, an empowering practice for you. Or, you know, right now as I'm recording this, it's during the quarantine and everybody's working from home in their pajamas with unbrushed teeth and ha- d- doesn't know why they're not able to focus. And beauty rolls out the red carpet for us to have a sensual and relaxed experience. And so to 
take all of that that I just shared and place it in a neat little bundle for you to take with you. I'm a Virgo and very into neat bundles. We have first, when it comes to slowing down, literally going slower in your speech, in your walk, in your gestures. We have adding a mantra such as, I am a mesmerizing sensual creature and allowing your body to respond and embody that thought. We have relaxed listening. We talked about focusing less on how it looks to be sensual and more on how it inherently, innately feels in your body. And finally, to start simply with a deliberate act of beauty. It has been such a joy and pleasure to record this inaugural episode And if you enjoyed it, I would be so grateful if you would be willing to leave me a review. As a new podcast, we really depend on your reviews. And so you can leave me a review on iTunes. There's actually a video. If you go to schoolofsensualliving.com slash review, you'll see a video of exactly how to leave a review. And I would be so, so grateful to hear your thoughts your comments, and your experiences with the podcast. See you next time. For more tools, inspiration, and community in the art of sensual living, head over to schoolofsensualliving.com. There you'll find a free course in how to embody genuine confidence through the secrets of powerful feminine body language. Go to schoolofsensualliving.com slash confidence to check it out today.